Barreling through the red tape, I'm, I'm kicking down your doors to talk about this. We're talking sugar gliders. We are talking about sugar gliders. What's a sugar glider? Well, let's practice the laser pointer. You see this, this, this cute little angel? See this little, this little cutie? You see that? Peeking its, peeking its face out, the eucalyptus? That's a sugar glider. That's, that's the meat and bones, the meat and potatoes. That's the heavy lifting we're gonna do today. A lot of you are like, I'm not, this is such a sensitive subject. I'm not afraid to go there with ya. So thank you for going on this journey with me. This is James Hardenfeld Presents. That is me, James Hardenfeld. Uh, I am presenting uh, the Sugar Gliders, nature's best thing. Best meaning nothing's better. Uh, thing, oops, thing being the, the glider itself. And I have a little quote here, the Sugar Glider is fucking amazing. A must see National Geographic. That's a direct quote, that's a direct quote. Don't put that online and attach my name to it, but that's a direct quote. That's a real thing. Uh, so we all, we know where we're going, okay. Uh, what is a sugar glider? Whoa, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Okay, now we're, now we're, now we're on a ride. Uh, the sugar glider is an Australian flying squirrel. Yeah, you're like, flying squirrels? I didn't know those were all the way down under. Uh, they are, they are, they're, they're primarily in Australia. Some people call them shuggies. Kind of in pop culture right now. Some people, a lot of shuggy communities out there. A lot of, a lot of people call them that, a little nickname. Uh, they're native to Australia, New Guinea, and Indonesian islands. They're primarily they are wild animals, but over the last 10 to 15 years, we're looking at efforts of domestication, and uh, they're considered an exotic pet. But much happier in the wild, they thrive in the wild. In the wild, they can glide almost 200 feet. Oh my God, that's so far. <laughs> that's a far glide for, I'm not gliding very far feet wise. Very few feet, um, very fearless creature. Uh, how did I get into sugar gliders? Maybe a little, uh, back, little backstory on that, a little origin story. Uh, used to own one. Owned a sugar glider. Am I proud of it? After learning so much about them, I am, I am not extremely proud of it, but I think I offered the sugar glider a better home. I, I, I acquired the sugar glider from someone I used to sell drugs to. <laughs> they, were, they were moving to Las Vegas. They were packing up their things, getting out of town. Had a spare sugar glider. Um, and I knew what they were because I hip to the game, I guess, uh, and, and, I, and I adopted it. And it was a really cool part of my life for a few years. Um, so I feel like I offered it a better life, but we can get more into maybe why, why it wasn't such a great idea at, at a certain point. Super, super special critter. Super special critters. Um, that is a real picture. That's a real picture. It's pretty cute, you know? It is pretty cute. I, uh, that's a sugar glider and it's on a motorcycle. Does it have a license to ride that? Probably not. Probably an unlicensed sugar glider. It's very cute. 96%, an estimated 96% of sugar gliders across the globe are certified adorable. That's a real statistic. Those are real numbers. And uh, the certification, a lot of colleges, institutions, respectable people uh, certify, the, certify these, these, these animals. Uh, there's the adorable data right there for you. There's the adorable data. Um, there's, uh, 90, there's the 96% we clearly see right here. It's, that is sugar gliders. They're certified. Adorable, and then we're looking at another like two percent other, uh, and another two percent general mystery. Not sure about that. 
It's probably the 2% of sugar gliders that are not taken very good care of, and um, there, there, there's been an obesity problem among us. Some sugar glider owners are not taking good enough care of their sugar gliders, let them eat a whole bunch of food. They don't have, what's that? Oh, you don't think I have the, I'm, I'm, I'm just as excited as you are. I'm, what's that? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm, they, they do eat, they eat, um, they eat a lot of different things. They're omnivores, um, which is super cool. Um, it's kind of like how a human being should almost eat. They have so many human characteristics Wait, and emotions. They, they don't eat human beings, but I like where your head's at. Anything's possible. Um, all data is current based on 2020 research conducted by both colleges and institutions. Scientific evidence is represented on the chart shown that we just went over. I just don't want anyone to leave here thinking I'm just making stuff up. Okay? That's, that's, I just want to cover, cover my bases. These are shirt gliders and hats. Oh, I really like that. I'm really into that. And next slide. Here we'll see a shirt glider, and it's okay. I don't know how that. I don't know. Whoa, what? How did that get in there? That's crazy. Who's putting that kind of? This is a science show. What a smoke show. What a severe hottie. That's crazy. I don't know who's... Oh my god. Did you put that in, Kyle? Maybe. Kyle... Wow. I'm so sorry. That's pretty nice, though. I got to Okay, <laughs> next slide. Uh, you had a question about uh, what, are, what, are the, what, are, what do they eat? What are these, what are these sugar gliders munching on? What's happening there? Uh, very diverse diet. Very important that their diet is diverse if you plan on acquiring one of these. You can get them in Washington. I do, they are not legal in, in Oregon, um, but they are becoming legal in more and more states. Um, they eat so many different types of bugs, mostly worms because they're easy to get, silkworms, mealworms, um, but the, in the wild they'll eat small birds, which is super interesting. You wouldn't expect this to be an animal that is going to go out of its way to hunt, but it will definitely eat eggs and birds and um, a lot of nuts. Um, I would feed mine um, this combination of things right here. Um, this yogurt, they, they will eat yogurt mixed with like a little bit of honey. They get the name sugar from, from sugar gliders. Or the name, yeah, the, they eat sugar, so they're gonna call them sugar gliders, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Uh, doing doing a lot of that that stuff, but uh, and then they're gonna eat fresh fruits and vegetables and um, and a heavy heavy protein source as well. So it's it's very it's very human, it's very diverse. Um, they have little hands, they have these little forefinger hands, and uh, it's really cool to watch watch these guys eat and um, and consume their meals. Very special and healthy. Um, they don't really do that. Yeah, they're not cheek stuffers. That's a good question, though. Um, they do like to eat. It's important for them to be eating throughout the day. They like to eat throughout the day. Um, but they're, they're not going to um, necessarily, like, store any food on their, on their personal bodies. But they will, like, carry, like, eucalyptus leaves with their tail and things like that, which is pretty cool. <laughs> oh, my God. How do these keep on... Why does this keep happening? That's crazy. Oh my gosh. What a hottie. I don't know how these guys, I don't even know how these got in there. I, I don't, maybe my kids did it. I don't, I don't even have kids. What am I saying? Single guy. I don't, I don't know how this keeps happening. This is so off topic. I'm, I have so many, I'm apologizing. I, I can't stop apologizing to all of you while we look at this slide. What a hunk. What a severe hunk. I, uh, gosh. Okay, let's get back on the subject. Um, just some cool facts. More hats and more sugar gliders. Ah, boy, that's, that's just cute. Um, 
The shrimp glider is a marsupial. They're going to carry their young in a little bit in a little bitty pouch, and uh, they're nocturnal, so they're going to be most active at night. Um, it's important during the daytime. If you were to own a sugar glider and keep keep one as a pet, that uh, you keep a nice nice dark area for them to be. Um, the last stat on the bottom talks about just a little fact, not a stat, but um, it talks about how the sugar glider can recognize and remember heartbeats by by staying close to you. So it's important that you have a little pouch that that you actually will keep the sugar glider in that that can have a little drawstring for it to be dark in there and nice and warm. And, uh, and, uh, and it can be next to your heart, so it's actually remembering who you are based on the rhythm of your heart, which is just a super special thing about these animals. They're extremely social, so they're actually going to remember the other heartbeats of the animals that they're around, and, um, and they need to identify you as part of that, that safety in their lives, because um, they can die of depression, and that's very, very sad. You, you don't want them to. Uh, you don't want them to be alone, or you don't. And you don't want them to be kept alone. It's. Um, it's. It's insane. Um, they're not going to eat. They're not going to come out. Um, they do when they're happy. They do like to actually be jumping around and moving around and having a good time. Um, so when they're not doing that, you know your shirt glider is just not feeling very good. Um, but like I said, they're they're not they are not domestic animals. Even though we are keeping them as pets more and more, it seems like. Um, and I already talked about the hands. They just have really cool hands. It's awesome to watch them cling and climb and grab and and uh, just those those little things. But how long did yours fly? Distance. Um, distance wise, I would just keep it in my studio, and then I left an aviation cage for it that was open. So it could be out and about. Um, it could go the distance of my kitchen, which was pretty long, um, probably almost 30 feet. And that was the biggest, biggest space in that studio. Would he fly to your shoulder, or what was the, what was the, what was the deal? Yeah, there was a branch above the doorway, and it would jump down and fly onto my shoulder. And that was like, they do bond with you quite, a, like, quite easily, and it's pretty fun to... They're a fun pet to have, that's for sure. Uh, but when you're trying to, uh, they will keep you up at night. Let's just say because they're they're nocturnal and so active at night. Are they loud? And they have a chirp and a bark to them, which is pretty interesting. Um, and uh, they do they do call, and it's sad because my sugar glider was named Friday, and lived alone, and when he was calling to try and mate and, and things like that. It, it was like, ah, sorry, like I'm. It's just you and me, buddy. Like, so that's why, like, you always have at least a pair. Um, and then the, that's a, an interesting theory there. I, I'm sure someone in Washington's trying that out. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure it's happened. Um, yeah, I think they do bond with other animals and, and things like that. You see them with the animals in other pictures. And, and things of that nature and other pets, which is cool. Whoa, okay. I don't know how this keeps, this is insane. This is, uh, I'm just, this presentation is just totally derailed by a total smoke show of a man. Oh my God. I'm starting to think maybe I did it. Maybe I put them in there. Maybe it was me. I don't know. I have no idea, but now we all know. We all just, now we're all, now we all know each other a little bit better. I, uh, this is just an important disclosure as we wrap up this conversation on nature's best thing. It's so important to follow the laws in your state. Do not own a single sugar glider without a pair or group. Give them a lot of time and attention. An aviation cage is not enough. You need special branches and spaces if interested in ownership. They have only been bred in the U.S. for the last 12 to 15 years. They're a long way from being having any sort of genetics type of domestication taking place in their breeding. They are cute, but they are only recently our friends. Please exercise research and caution. That's all I advise. And thank you so much. We really appreciate your coming out. My uh, presentation today actually is all about comedy, which means laughter and the punchline. I did not prepare the PowerPoint the last minute. They told me I had to submit it, you know, because uh, you know what? The comedy is actually a language art, 
All you're gonna do is just listen. So now the PowerPoint uh, presentation is kind of help with the punchline, but all of a sudden you add the visual into it. And then I heard guys are really visual, right? You you guys are visual. And then recently though, the the research says women's also visual. So when I when you hear my comedy now, you have a visual aid. Just make sure don't get hard, okay? And ladies, don't get wet. All right, it's just laugh, okay? Just laugh. Uh, so that's why I don't have a whole lot of the slide today because I didn't prepare. It's not part of the comedy routine. And first of all, I want to say my general impression about court, okay? Um, you know, Portland is next to Washington State, but Portland is famous I lately. I think it's the transgender people. You guys have a lot of transgender people, right? Guys, agree with me? Yeah. I feel like in Washington State, that somehow the, the gays are lesbian, they're old school. You know, <laughs> yeah, your, your transgender people are setting the trend. So next time on public transportation, gay, lesbian, gave the C to transgender people, all right? <laughs> yes. Why don't you? I'm still doing, I'm just few jokes today, and the last will be the uh, my game show proposal. Okay, so I'm still going to jokes. Uh, and and uh, ever since I started coming in, last year, 2019, I come to Portland for, uh, for comedy and also try to mingle with some of the uh, comics here. And I, you know, guess what? There are those open mics. I did it here. There's so many transgender people, comics. And some, somebody even say they don't even know what sex they are. They just like uh, multi-sex, right? It's like, whoa, what gender is that? So I actually Google it. So I Google like, uh, fuck everything sex. What is that? <laughs> fuck everybody. And, and then Google somehow direct me to a porn site. So I cannot figure it out, you Portland guys, so sex, all right? OK, so that's. Um, like I said, uh, my name is Ying, my name is Ying, and I'm looking for Yang. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yin, this Yin Yang concept in China is the balance, right? Everything needs to be Yin and Yang balance, so make the whole world a whole, right? So, uh, like you said, I was a single mother, so right now I'm not balanced. I'm just Yin, I'm looking for Yang, but it's not what you think, it's not, it's not like that, okay? Uh, it's not like I'm looking for my half soulmate. I'm not looking for to make myself a whole. Uh, no, I'm not like that. Uh, I'm just looking for one night stand. You know, yeah. Uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, I I I just looking for someone young. Any youngs out here? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, just, okay, good, we can talk after show. Okay. So just any young that, if I'm successful, so I can update my Facebook status from solo traveler to open for hookups. What is running for president right now? Who's, oh, the single lady? Yeah, I'm not sure she NBA. is. Andrew Yang, but he is taken. He's married with two kids. So. He is off on my radar screen, all right? <laughs> but when I presented this joke to the Chinese New Year celebration, they told me, no, the joke is too negative. You, you need to be positive. You need to be uh, lift people's spirit. So I'm like, okay, so I'm redoing my yin yang joke. Okay? I'm still looking for yang, though. I'm look, uh, still looking for yang. But P1, do you know uh, what is yin yang in China specifically means? So yang is actually everything positive, okay? Like literally in, in China, yang actually means erect penis. <laughs> you know, yang is male, it's a father, okay? It's positive, it's a son, it's a fire. And yang is uh, energy, okay? Strong and power and the rainbow. That's you guys, okay? And what is yin in, in Chinese culture, Chinese language? Yin means female, right? It's really dark, you cannot see. So yin is moon, opposite of sun, okay? And yin is water, opposite of fire. And yin is a negative, uh, a darkness, and that's yin. And yin is a cloud. So that's what I'm looking for. A <laughs> rainbow over a cloud. Okay? I'm only have a cloud, you know, anyway. So. So that's my punchline. Uh, and then the Chinese, Chinese people would think, okay, that message is okay. 
So now I'm actually, I'm not sure that rainbow is gonna make me a whole, but at least it's over me, you know? So that's great, that's great. Um, and as you know, uh, last weekend, it's just Chinese New Year. Right? Chinese New Year came and went, Lunar New Year, you know, without a noise, with everybody just isolating themselves. Yeah. Do I get that? Okay. You know, and all because a Mexican beer. You know, just so blame the Mexicans. You know, I they cancel my show. I prepared the show. They cancel it. So uh, when you have six hundred people in, in the theater, no, that's the chance to the the virus. Yeah, so that's why I'm doing it here. I, I even changed the title of my today's show. It's supposed to be about Chinese New Year, but I didn't get to do it last last week, so I'm changing to a game show. Um, so what I'm thinking is the, the, the year of rats, right? This is, 2020 is a year of rats. You know, we might as well change to a year of virus, you know, or corona, right? The year of corona. That, that's what corona virus look like, you know? Well, rats do bring disease. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> the, you know, what so I'm saying, you know, uh, uh, year of rats, I, I really think it's about time. Chinese people put a virus on their zodiac map. How's that sound? Yeah, you see that? Because it seems like a virus comes wrong every 12 to 15 years anyway. You know, that first was SARS, you know, about 15 years ago. Now this year is Corona. So I'm predicting, okay, going forward, 12, 15 years, that's our new future virus. It looked more like, uh, 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 you know, uh, owl, the, tech, the high tech virus. Do you like that? Yeah, like yeah, that? yeah it's good. Yeah, might as well. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna celebrate virus. I don't think any Chinese people will like this. <laughs> it's just my idea. It's just, it comes around every 12, 15 years anyway. Um, so uh, uh, Chinese people, they're not going any, anywhere and not touching anything. So I ordered something online. And guess what? The virus traveled fast to my package. I'm still waiting for my package. The virus came. <laughs> you know. Uh, I think that's that's all about my uh, my <laughs> my joke, short jokes. Uh, so my new proposal, like the introduction part of it, is a new reality TV show. This one is existing, okay? And the survivor show reality TV is the first reality TV in this country. Do you know that? Do you even know? That? And the longest running. And it's still running, right? It's Mark uh, uh, Ber Burnett, that's his name. He's the one that started the survival. Actually, it's imported from uh, England, Great Britain. You know, they, they, they're good at these kind of shows. So you know what? I'm like, that show, I'm, right now, I'm just really fed up with that show because that show is just really recruiting a whole bunch of white people. Worse than my laser thing, okay. They just uh, drop these uh, white people half naked, just drop them to an isolated island, right? Do you guys have watched that show? Survivor, that reality TV? Like, it's still running though. I think it's still running. Uh, so 21 days later, whoever that survived uh, you, you know, eating worm or whatever, and then they reward the winner. The winner of one million dollars. That's the show right now. And I think that's bullshit. That's just so fake. Look at this guy. I don't think he's hungry, look. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know how can you survive 21 days or eating almost nothing or just worms and still this, this you know, looking good. I guess bullshit. Yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, but, but American people, they do, you guys do like to watch reality TV, right? Yeah, right, you like that, right? Okay, and then there's so many people out there really trying to survive. So why don't we put the two and two together, right? You know what I'm saying? And who is out there trying to survive, guys? People? So what about the people south of Texas border? These people, right? These people are real. Okay, they're not fake, not like those white guys, you know, right here. These are fake, okay? They're just well-fed, everybody, and they're happy, and they're trying to, look, these people are, are real, you know what I'm saying, and they're on foot. 
They're trying to survive because whatever trouble they get into, they're trying to come here. So I think my, my show idea is we're going to have these 5,000 ca uh, caravan. Remember that news yeah. going <laughs> again? 5,000, 5,000 now ready to invade our country on, on caravan. I think that's a rumor. I don't think they're 5,000 all fit into a caravan. But anyway, I'll just call them. Okay, I'm just gonna use that word, the terminology they, they give to us. So, caravan people, um, where's, okay, where's, okay, right, right here. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, instead of building that wall, okay, this is where I put a, a gate upon later for, for later. <laughs> what I'm saying is like, my show idea is, instead of building a wall, let's, let's build something like that. But, but let's talk about wall, because I am, from a country that have the wall expertise, right? right? <laughs> this is our wall. And Chinese wall is like 1,500 no, or 2,000 miles long, okay? And then the Chinese people build their wall along the mountain tops. I'm saying, who would go to that kind of wall? You, in the old days, the, the, when they fight a different tribe, they ride a horse. You think the horse would get on here, right? The horse goes through the valleys. You gotta build a wall in the valleys, right? At least America now, the Texas and Arizona border is all flat, plain. They build a wall now. So what I'm saying is like the Chinese people build a wall. A thousand years haven't walked, haven't worked. Now, uh, so this is my wall idea, okay? And the whole program idea, I'm saying, okay, five thousand people. Uh, we're gonna, uh, but instead of the wall, okay, we put a camera along the border. How about that? Put a camera on the border, and instead of a wall, we're gonna build the like the swamp land, like a few hundred acres or thousand acres. So these caravan people, yeah, first they didn't get drawn themselves, they didn't, you know, sink in the swamp or wetland. Okay, we let them go. It's kind of like Hunger Games city. Have you watched the uh, the movie Hunger Games? Yeah. You know, Hunter and Haunted. Plus, we have a Texas Ranger. You know, ready to shoot you. We let the five thousand migrants just go, right? I don't think the migrants have have have, have gone. They, you know, they have probably have tried to, you know, hide in the bushes. Uh, Cause the Texas Rangers are afraid to shoot. All right. Okay, just game idea. Okay, it's not real. Right? And these uh, migrants, this immigrant, have to fight the wild animals, right? The the snakes, the scorpions. I bet the animals may be the most friendly creature in their during their journey, okay? So if we still have a hundred people survive, okay, they haven't uh if they haven't gotten by the Texas Ranger or the animals, by the wall, just before that wall, we're gonna build some gator pump. How's that? We'll go back to that. Right here. The gator pump, right? So we have let's say make assumption, 100, 200 people try to swim across this gator pump. This is the last defense. That's what I'm saying. So if they can get across this gator palm, okay. and they're the winner, right? They're the winner. We let them come in free, and the award to them is minimum wage jobs. Yeah. Yeah. How about that, right? And we're not giving them one million dollars. So these are all corporate jobs. You know, a meat processing plant. This is a corporate farm jobs, and these are the picking the apple or whatever. Don't you like that idea? Woo! Wow. <laughs> you guys are, I'm not sure about that, right? I think humanity is lost. Hey, it's just a game idea. You guys like to watch, you know, some really wild shit. This is it. Okay, that's my show. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's kind of funny that um, Ming and James had hot shirtless guys in that presentation, and I'm the one gay guy on the panel, and I don't have any. Um, it's kind of odd that way. Um, it's being, being gay is great, except when you have a Republican conservative mother who lives in Florida. Anybody have conservative Republican parents? Anybody? You do? Where do they, where do they live? Virginia. Virginia. See, you go below that Mason-Dixon line, and there they are. You know, I came out to my mother in the 80s, and she says, we didn't have homosexuals in the 1950s. So uh, I said, well, somebody put the fins on those Cadillacs. Um, somebody did those beehive hairdos. So um, we have a good friend, uh, 
Jenny, who is a lesbian, and she also has a very conservative Republican mother in Florida, and she came out to her mom as a lesbian, and her mother goes, what's next, Jenny? Heroin? Uh, <laughs> lesbianism, the gateway drug. Um, <laughs> but um, my husband and I just celebrated our 22nd anniversary. Thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, since 1997, uh, again, before many of you were born, and um, when I first took Gary down to meet my mom in Florida. We, we, my mom is just so clueless. We're eating dinner, she looks across and goes, now which one of you is gay? And it's like, okay. Uh, which one of you needs Thorzy, mom? But um, she's a pain in the ass. Anybody have mothers who are a pain in the ass? Come on. She's 95, she's always complaining nobody ever calls her. So I got one of those, how am I driving bumper stickers? Um, so the phone hasn't stopped ringing. Anyway. Um, I, I have a title uh, for my political button collection uh, for this, when will he have them all, because my loving husband is the greatest, except he's not a fan of my hobby. I've been collecting political buttons, as I mentioned, since 1974. I now have 21,185. That's a lot of buttons, a lot of time to curate it. Because there are a lot of buttons in the house and a lot of time, Gary really doesn't like the buttons a lot. Uh, but I did uh, put them in storage. As I mentioned, I put them on high-end canvas as art. Every candidate gets a canvas of uh, governors. Each state has three huge canvases for governor, senator, congress, mayor. Uh, so it's a lot to store. But I finally get them out of the house. And uh, the reason I have this as the title is because every day in the mail, I get anywhere from two to 10 packages of buttons uh, from eBay from auctions, from people I trade with around the country. And about a year ago, a postal guy, Gary was getting the mail, and the postal guy says, what is all this shit that Carl gets every day? And, and Gary said, my husband collects political buttons, and the post guy said to him, when will we have them all? Uh, and the answer is, of course, never. Um, I joined a group called American Political Items Collectors uh, in 1974. It's the, the group for the hobby. We take it seriously. Um, I have 21,000 buttons. The most, that's probably the most of anyone in Oregon. In fact, I know it is. But the person with the most buttons is my good friend Ken Rudin, a long time on uh, OPB, our P, uh, public broadcasting announcer, who has over 70,000 buttons in his collection. His wife divorced him several years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, I want to talk a little bit about buttons, just about 10 or 12 minutes here on Buttons 101. One -on -one. And as I said, I put them on high-end canvas. It's very expensive, but I want to display these buttons as art for eventually a museum. This is, uh, uh, and by the way, some of these are professionally photographed for publication. You'll see, if, uh, you can tell the ones that are professionally photographed versus the ones, excuse me, that are not. I just grabbed off uh, my iPhone the other day. This is my Lyndon Johnson 1964 canvas. That's four feet by four feet. Um, and um, by the way, uh, up at the top, uh, where's our, oh, there we go. Up at the top there, that's a nine inch button. Yeah, Jesus uh, in uh, China, it's known as 9G. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> This was not meant to be worn. Uh, these were, there's a die cut stand in the back. You actually would put these up in shop windows and so forth. Uh, but this is uh, my Lyndon Johnson collection. Uh, there are three categories that we collect. Uh, presidential buttons, including those who were nominees of their party and those who were also rands, like Marianne Williamson this year. Uh, and then uh, there are local buttons, which would be governors, senators, congressmen, mayors, state senators, and so forth. And finally, cause. And I'll show you a few of those uh, just upcoming. This is uh, Shirley Chisholm. I don't know if anyone remembers Shirley Chisholm from 1972. Great woman, she was the first African American to run, woman to run for the major, uh, run for the nomination of a major party. This is, uh, obviously the, the buttons for also, the canvases for also ran, so are a little bit smaller. Um, this is, uh, let's see, the next one is third party buttons, like Socialist Labor Party, Green yeah. Party, uh, Libertarian Party, Prohibition Party, which by the way is the oldest political party in the United States. This is from the 1980 race. Uh, Angela, come on. Yeah. With the big hair and the afro. Woo. This is from a, an extensive Communist Party collection. These are examples of third party buttons. Then we have uh, what are called locals. This board, uh, again, a four foot by four foot. These are races for mayor of New York City. They're in chronological order, starting uh, with the earliest buttons and then going up to Mayor Bill de Blasio here. Um, and also, let's see, this is another example. This is uh, 
uh, races for governor of Pennsylvania, starting again with the early races and moving up. The fun of displaying these this way is that when people see these buttons, it's like an oral history. I have friends from Pennsylvania who worked on, will remember working on Milton Schaap's campaign, they'll remember working uh, actually more recently for Red Rendell, and they will see the boards and they will bring out the oral history, what they remember at the time. My husband's dad uh, grew up in South Dakota, so he loves to look at my South Dakota canvases and remember all the candidates for run, uh, races he volunteered on and so forth. So I hope when they're displayed, they will act as a springboard for kind of an oral history. Uh, cause is the third uh, category. This is an early women's suffrage button. Um, this is a, one of, uh, I have about 100 anti-Vietnam War buttons. So this is one of them. Yeah. Thank you for cheering against the Vietnam War. You're really with the curve. Thank you so much. Uh, and of course, gay rights buttons. These are a couple that were produced for Harvey Milk Street here in Portland. Um, buttons began, buttons as we know them, were first introduced in 1896. If you, there were no political buttons before 1896. What there uh, was before 1896 are what are called ferrotypes. This is a photographic emulsion uh, spread over a thin layer of either iron or tin. This is an Abraham Lincoln ferrotype. If you have one of these, it's like maybe worth about $1,000 and up, especially for a Lincoln one. The buttons that we know today uh, were first introduced in 1896 by this man, who was uh, Mark Hanna, who was a Republican senator from Ohio, who ran William McKinley's presidential campaign in 1896. He was kind of a P.T. Barnum guy, and he decided that buttons would be a great way to introduce uh, fun to a political campaign. The celluloid, if you know what celluloid was, it was, this, it was uh, invented in the 1880s, and celluloid buttons, which are most of the buttons you see, so I'll take a picture. In fact, this is a, a, a William McKinley celluloid button. Uh, they take a photograph of William McKinley, then they cover it with celluloid. Actually, celluloid is flammable, so today it's acetate, not celluloid. And they cover it, and then in a collet and a pin in the back holds it in place. So the two types of buttons are celluloids, cell, cellos as they're called, and 1916 litho buttons, where you actually print the button, stamp it on tin, right on the tin. Lithos became uh, popular in 1916. So buttons are either cellos or lithos. Uh, early days of buttons uh, were very colorful, actually. These are some of my William Jennings Ryan's button, Ryan buttons. He ran in 1896, lost in McKinley, lost in 1900, lost in 1908. Um, and, uh, but they were very colorful in, in the early days. This uh, right here in the hobby is called a Jewgate. J-U-G-A-T-E. When you have the presidential candidate and the vice presidential candidate both pictured on a button, it's called a jugate, which comes from the word conjugate, two together. This was uh, Brian and John Kern who got their ass kicked in 1908. <laughs> but uh, that's called a jugate, and jugates are worth more than just regular pi picture buttons. In the early days, uh, buttons were produced by certain manufacturers these are a couple of Woodrow Wilson buttons. Again, uh, let me go back. These are uh, the, this one here, of course, a, a Jugate down here. Uh, Wilson and his running mate Marshall. But old buttons have what are called back paper, uh, and it shows who produced the button. The most celebrated button producers, those who produced the first buttons, were Whitehead and Hogue out of Newark, New Jersey. If you have a Whitehead and Hogue button, this back paper. It's worth a hell of a lot more. Bastion Brothers out of Rochester, New York, was one of the first manufacturers. Here in Oregon, it was a company called Irwin Hudson. So old Oregon buttons will have the Irwin Hudson back paper. Then after very colorful buttons around the 1920s, design started to get really black and white. And one of the great things about displaying buttons is not only you're seeing the history of American politics, but you're seeing the evolution of design as well. They were very, well, Calvin Coolidge wasn't the brightest, uh, you know, the most uh, vivacious guy. Uh, a lot of the, uh, in the 20s and 30s, were very, very black and white, very small, very boring buttons. Then we went into a red, white, and blue phase where everyone had to have red, white, and blue buttons. I guess it was considered American. Then about the late 60s, you can imagine with the Cultural Revolution and into the, the 70s, we got some splashes of color. Here's a, uh, just a screen grab from one of my McGovern boards, as you can see very colorful buttons representing, you know, the peace movement of the time and so forth. Um, and the more stylized buttons of today. So today, anything goes. And again, part of the 
um, showing in the presentation an exhibition of all these canvases, which eventually will be 600. I've finished 250 at this point. If I live long enough, I will have about 600. But is to show political stories and also this evolution of style. Uh, these are called tabs right here. Uh, uh, if you may have seen these, these are popular uh, way back actually in the, in the 20s and 30s and up into the 60s where you would bend these over a, a pocket and wear them. This is a screen grab from my John F. Kennedy. As you can see, all red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue, red, white, and blue. It's unusual to have that color even in 1960 in the tabs. One of the things I love about collecting buttons is because you learn about history. Every button tells a story. Every candidate has a different story. This guy right here was Anton Cermak. He was mayor of Chicago, Illinois in the late 20s and early 30s. And believe it or not, this guy changed the course of history like you would not believe. On February 15th, 1933, Franklin Roosevelt, who had just been elected president in 1932, was in Miami, Florida. Now, I say president-elect because you think, oh, when wasn't he inaugurated January 20th? 1933. Back then, the inauguration was March 20th of the following year. That's because in the old days, it took a while to ride a horse to get to Washington, D.C. So they gave you a lot of time between November winning and heading to Washington. Uh, it was changed for the next inauguration, January 20th. So Franklin Roosevelt is shaking hands in Miami, Florida on February 15th, 1933. And a guy named Giuseppe Zangara fired three shots in an attempt to assassinate Franklin D. Roosevelt. This guy, Anton Cermak, was shaking hands with Roosevelt, jumped in front of him, took the bullet, and died six weeks later. Um, this is a memorial button for Anton Cermak. Had he not done that, Franklin Roosevelt would have died. We would have had James Nance Garner as our president, who was a conservative from Texas. I would probably say we would never have Social Security or the banking laws or the New Deal that we enjoy today. So that's a lesson about Anton Cermak. This guy was uh, James Reed, who was a, a senator from Missouri. Uh, he is notable because in 1913, when Woodrow Wilson proposed the Federal Reserve Act, he couldn't get it out of the Senate Banking Committee. It was a tie. James Reed from Missouri changed his vote for Woodrow Wilson. In return, Missouri got two Federal Reserve Banks. It's the only state with two. If you look at your money, you'll see Kansas City and St. Louis. They got that because James Reed sucked it up. Not sucked it up. He pretty much gave his vote away so his state of Missouri would gain. Uh, one of my favorite um, politicians, because she had an incredible sense of humor, was uh, the late Margaret Chase Smith, a longtime Republican senator from Maine. Uh, she, uh, she was the kind of Republican we don't have anymore. She opposed Joe McCarthy. She had a conscience, and she had an incredible sense of humor. She was also uh, often mentioned in the 50s as a possible first woman president. She had one of the greatest lines in political history. A reporter said to her one day, he said, Senator Smith, what would you do if you woke up and found yourself in the White House? She said, I would get dressed, run downstairs, <laughs> apologize to Mrs. Eisenhower, and leave. Um, <laughs> And she did run for the Republican nomination in 1960 and lost. She's the kind of Republican we don't have anymore, and too bad uh, that we don't have them anymore. Slogans are always part of a great campaign. When Wendell Wilkie ran in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt, not having been killed by Giuseppe Zagar, was going for a third term. Unprecedented. A lot of the Wilkie buttons were no third term. And one of my favorites, no man. Uh, no man is good three times. As a gay man, I can tell you that is not true. Um, uh, I've had many men four or five times, and they are still awfully good. Um, thank you very much. Uh, people will always use design to get attention. One of my favorites, uh, you all know Zach Galifianakis between two ferns? His uncle, you may not know, and Nick Galifianakis served three terms uh, in the United States Congress in North Carolina, a liberal Democrat. Uh, in 72, he ran against Jesse Helms and narrowly lost for U.S. Senate, but his attention grabber was his name was so long, he put him on two buttons. Um, yeah, it's, it was, he also had a button pair when he ran for Congress, so that's pretty cool. When Jimmy Carter ran in 1976, it was the bicentennial year. Everything, again, was red, white, and blue, red, white, and blue, so the Carter campaign made a decision to have most of their buttons, their official buttons, be green just to stand out from all the vomit of red, white, and blue in 1976. And also, he ran on a platform for the environment. 
Johnson's campaign put out the chemical uh, compound for urine and piss on gold water. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite buttons to collect. <laughs> yeah, this was one of my favorites from uh, Bush Cheney, Compassion of Colonialism. Uh, thank you for getting that. And of course, uh, Bill Sizemore, Oregon's only indicted Republican candidate <laughs> for governor. Uh, of course, today, uh, you take your pick about Trump. Um, I actually made a decision after Trump won, uh, quote unquote, in, in 2016, not to include any Donald Trump button in my collection. I will not go that low. Uh, yeah. The ultimate funny button, though, that was funny unintentionally was the one uh, made, manufactured, paid for, and distributed by a, old, a woman, Republican woman's group in Pennsylvania. And Nixon was running in 1960. This is a huge collector's item, and they put out a button that said, they can't lick our dick. <laughs> this, this slogan has been repeated on buttons. You'll see it, but the original, there are only about 200 made. They go for a lot of money. And needless to say, uh, when the uh, women in Pennsylvania found out about this, they were not amused. <laughs> uh, terrible, terrible, terrible. Um, this set is uh, interesting in button history because when Nixon ran in 1968, his official slogan was Nixon's The One. The day that these buttons were delivered to Nixon campaign headquarters in 1975, this man was seen leaving the building. Nixon people and campaign aides were so horrified that this man was in the building. This man is Dick Tuck, who just died two years ago at the age of 95, the greatest political prankster of all time. His target was always Richard Nixon. In 1956, when Nixon was running for vice president, uh, he went to, I believe, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Nixon had a whistle-stop train tour of California, and just as Nixon started to speak, uh, Big Tuck played the, paid the engineer of the train $50 to pull out just as Nixon started to speak, which is one, one of the great campaign pranks in American history. In 1962, when Nixon was running for governor of California, Nixon was campaigning in Chinatown, and the crowds came out with all of these signs, which, uh, and this was on TV, and the people thought that Nixon, they were saying great things about Nixon. Dick Tuck had given the people in Chinatown uh, the symbol for corruption. And uh, Nixon was so pissed when he found out about this. Obviously, Nixon's the one was his campaign slogan in 1968. Dick Tuck paid a number of highly pregnant African-American women to go to Nixon's rally with the, with the um, Nixon. button, Nixon's the one. Uh, absolutely true. Nixon hated Dick Tuck. If you look, at, listen to the, if you listen to the uh, tapes from Watergate, you will hear all that goddamn Dick Tuck. Um, what the hell is he all up his goddamn sleeve? Uh, so that was a little Dick Tuck. Uh, fast forward to 1974 when Nixon was impeached. Nixon ordered his Attorney General Elliot Richardson to fire Cox. Richardson refused, and re Nixon fired him. Uh, uh, Ruckel's house, John Ruckel's house, the deputy attorney general, William Ruckel's house, also refused to fire the special prosecutor. Nixon fired him. Robert Bork, who was solicitor general, went ahead and fired Archibald Cox. One of the great buttons from my water great board is about Nixon impeached the Cox sacker. So uh, again, a little bit of double entendre. What are buttons worth? The uh, Truman buttons are worth a lot because they didn't make many of them in 1948. If you remember, Truman wasn't expected to win. They were kind of pricey item back in 1948, so his campaign didn't produce a lot of buttons. Uh, this button up here, you expect to pay about 150 bucks for a button like that, Truman buttons. Why I love to collect locals buttons, locals, is because the value of the button is determined by what happens for history. What you're looking at is a governor button for Jimmy Carter when he ran for governor of Georgia in 1970. 1970, you would buy this button for about 10 cents. After Carter became president, you couldn't get one for less than $50, and that's a lot of money in the 1970s to spend on a button. Similarly, Barack Obama, his Senate buttons uh, now fetch about $80 to $120 if you can find one. What is uh, the most expensive button? Uh, the Holy Grail of uh, our hobby is the Cox Roosevelt Jew game. There were about 80 of these known to exist. They come in various styles. 
1920, James Cox was the Democratic nominee from Ohio. He picked as his running mate, you may not know this, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy. That's a young FDR in 1920. They, again, weren't expected to win, and they didn't. They didn't produce a lot of buttons. Only about 80 Cox Roosevelt two gates are known to exist today. There is one in Oregon, uh, and the last one went on auction 2017 for a total of $47,279. So I have a dream where uh, Gary comes home and all our shit is out in the street <laughs> and we've sold our condo and I tell him, but I have 10 Cox Roosevelt Jugets. <laughs> Just to end, my goal is to have a museum with all of these canvases. It would have to be a massive museum. I want an interactive museum where uh, people can see uh, videos and documentaries that go along with our state's political history. Uh, everything, I've got everything from Archie Bunker buttons uh, to inaugural buttons for all the presidents. These are Jimmy Carter inaugural buttons to current buttons for Mayor Pete, for instance. Um, again, um, it's an incredible hobby. I'm glad to be, uh, be a part of it for all these years. And uh, I did have a, a an exhibition at Concordia University here in Portland in 2014 with about 55 campuses. Uh, oh, Concordia, yeah. Uh, it was uh, really an incredible couple of weeks over there. We had huge crowds. Uh, I hope when I get up to about 400 canvases in another year or two, I'm going to have a, try to have a big exhibition in Portland. Uh, these are some of the uh, button canvases at Concordia University. And of course, my slogan, whoever dies with the most buttons wins. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you guys for sticking around and getting an education about stuff. My name is Caroline. I had the most time to drink the most out of all the presenters. But uh, jokes on y'all, I drink before every comedy show. So. All right, where's the clicker thing? All right, so I'm going to be talking about the history of sweet tea. I'm originally from the South. Um, I used to be a fat child, so usually I actually drink tea with sweet and low in it and not actual sugar. Um, just. So, you know, I don't want you guys to think that I'm an actual sweet tea drinker. But, uh, all right, so we're going to get into it. A brief history of sweet tea, a misunderstood beverage. All right, so this is going to shock the shit out of some of you guys. But uh, sweet tea uh, was not originally from the South. It actually was invented in the North. Shocker, I know. So uh, one reason is because... Um, so ice was like a huge commodity, and it's not something you could just get easily in the South. Uh, originally, ice was uh, harvested from ponds and lakes. Super fucking sanitary, I know. Um, and then they would harvest this in the winter in the North, and they would store it in ice houses. So originally, iced tea was in the North, and um, originally uh, it was enjoyed in cities like Chicago, Boston, and New York. I know Boston kind of has a tumultuous history uh, with tea. As you guys know. And then, um, so sweet cheese popularity parallels the development of refrigeration. The ice box was patented in 1803, and they're pretty common in most households by the mid 1800s, especially if you're up, upper middle class. And so then they started shipping ice from the frozen lakes and um, ponds down to the south, and they are stored in these commercial insulated ice houses. And then mechanical ice basic making was invented in the 1800s, but that was something you didn't have unless you were like super rich. So the oldest recipe, it comes from a cookbook um, that was in Virginia and it was published in 1879. <laughs> and originally sweet tea was actually made out of green tea. I know, another whew, shocker. <laughs> but, um, and originally, um, We'll get to this in a second, but so it was an upper class beverage because it was more expensive than coffee. And then um, when the British invaded India, uh, they started taking over the tea plantations there. And so they started importing black tea and that made it a lot more affordable for like the regular person. But also originally tea, sweet tea was uh, full of booze um, as it should be. We love our booze in the South. Um, so originally you would see sweet tea be green tea with um, usually like bourbon or something in it. And um, it'd be a punch for like cotillions and parties. It had fun names like Regent's Punch, uh, named after George I or IV. Uh, Charleston St. Cecilia Punch, you could get your religious references in there with your alcohol. 
uh, Savannah's Chatham Artillery Punch, and then as you guys saw when I was drinking earlier, a drink called an Ice Pick with a sweet tea and vodka mixed together. It's like the original, thank you, it's like the original uh, Red Bull and uh, vodka. You get, I've got like a buzz from the caffeine and the vodka uh, here at the same time. But yeah, so originally uh, tea was grown in South Carolina. There was a botanist that brought um, the tea plants over in the 1700s. He also imported camellias, gardenias, and azaleas. Um, you can still find those plants at a place in South Carolina called Middleton Place Gardens. But all right, so sweet tea became popular in 1904 at the St. Louis World's Fair. And a lot of people think it was invented at the World's Fair. It had actually been around for a while. But um, they have record temperatures at this World's Fair, and this guy who was a representative of the India Tea Company, um, Richard, I have no idea how to pronounce his last name, but let me butcher it for you. It's going to be Black in Den. Sure, that sounds like that works. Um, it was like 100 degrees out, and he was like, hey, I'm giving out free hot tea. And everyone's like, I don't want this shit. That's nasty. And he was like, how about I put it through an iced pipe, which I don't, I couldn't find out anything on how these pipes were iced, um, but they were made out of lead, yay. And everyone's like, yeah, I want some of this free iced tea um, through a lead pipe, and he's like, here, I've got some for you. And um, then he started um, selling them at Bloomingdale's, where he gave out free leaded tea to all the shoppers. And uh, true story, that is how iced tea became popular <laughs> in America. Um, you got some free iced tea along with some free um, mental incapacitation. I think lead doesn't matter as much as if you're an adult, um, but I'm, it does it's horrify me to think some people might have like you know stunted um, their children's like mental capacities giving them iced tea. People will give their babies sweet tea in a bottle in the south to stop them from crying. You know what I'm talking about? They'll put coke in there too, and the um, and like a sippy cup, the carbonation will go up their nose, and then they. This is so gross. They will, they'll get something called bottle wrap where they wrap their little baby teeth out. But I'm like, whatever, they're getting a second set of teeth. It's fine. Just shut those babies up. Stop crying. <laughs> All right. I Man, I really zoomed through this. If you guys want to know how to make sweet tea, you can either watch this show on YouTube or you can take a picture of this and I'll tell you how to make it. All right. I'm gonna brew it for three and a half minutes at 208 degrees. That's four degrees less than boiling, so you can boil the water, let it cool off a little bit. You're gonna really use a black tea from India called Milgari. And the reason why I use that, it is the only black tea that doesn't cloud up when you ice it. So you can use other black teas and it'll taste the same, but it's gonna look all weird. This will make it like nice and clear. Yeah, Milgari, from the Milgari Mountains. You're gonna to want to use one tablespoon of sugar per eight ounces. <laughs> this is very important. Uh, also, you wanna dissolve the sugar while the tea is hot, pour it over ice. Um, you can pour it through a lead pipe and put booze in it if you want. Uh, it is up to you. Any questions? 